Hello everyone, I'm Grandmaster Dennis Borsch and I will start a new series now that is called the Rui Lopez Gambits. This is a specific gambit line that I want to show you guys that could be very interesting and can spice up your Rui Lopez days. So let's go! b4 e5, bishop b5, all very traditional, trying to put pressure on the knight. e6, retaining the pressure, sort of the key element of the Rui Lopez or the Spanish variation. Knight f6, d4. And this is a very, very interesting Rui Lopez a gambit line where white gives up a pawn in the hopes of trying to put this king in danger. He takes d4, castles. So white is ready to part with this pawn in order to be able to go for e5 breaks later on. Now, Machulski is a well-known player, but his opponent is even greater. Yafim P. Geller is obviously well-known as a second of Karpov, later for Kasparov, and also multiple times winner and a Soviet champion. Goes bishop e7, and here there's a specific move that makes a lot of sense. Here Machulski goes rook e1, over defends the e pawn, and prepares the c5 push. Now Geller would go d6, knight takes d4, and in fact, black would be under some pressure due to this pin via the bishop on a4. Therefore, black often plays b5. If castles, e5 would already lead to a very pleasant position for white. If the knight goes back, white wouldn't take on d4 necessarily, but go for c3, sacrifice another pawn, and get very, very good counterplay in the shape and form of the Danish gambit. So that's why Geller played b5 here. And instead of leaning back and relaxing, Machulski goes for e5. If pawn takes, pawn takes, you can't take with the bishop, pawn takes, and knight takes d4, and even though black won a couple of pawns, those are doubled, and the whole situation and black's king is in shambles. So that's why here, Yefim actually ventures for knight takes e5. Now, knight d5 would be the most normal move, but again, white can go bishop b3, put pressure, go c3, try to trade it off. If not, white gets the big center. And if black takes, knight takes c3, castles, bishop f4, and white gets plentiful compensation for the sacrificed pawn. White will be quick to go bishop c2, queen d3, and set up a battery on EFM Geller's position. So here Geller decided to take, rook takes c5, pawn takes a4, knight d4. And in this case, white is down a pawn. However, black's pieces are a little bit scattered and still in the garage. Castles, obviously d6 is not possible here due to knight c6 and you lose the queen and probably the game too. Castles, knight c3, attacking the pawn but mostly controlling some crucial squares. Rook e8, bishop g5, not taking the pawn just yet, using some pressure instead on black's pieces. Bishop b7, knight f5, exerting enormous pressure. Bishop f8. Now, if white would face bishop b4, white could go queen d4, exerting more latent pressure on g7 and hitting the bishop at the same time. If trades, queen takes, white actually still has a huge, huge initiative. And of course, if knight e4, black is actually made it in two moves. Knight f8 was played by the cautious Soviet grandmaster, queen d4. And look at this. Actually, even though black is up a pawn, white is the one with the initiative as all of black's pieces are still on the 8th. c5, queen f4, rook takes c5. And this is the moment I'd like you to stop watching and pause it, because this is the moment you may come up with a brilliant idea that Machulski finds. So do take a moment, take a moment there, you may get pleasantly surprised. So it's white to move and win. So I hope you had a good time figuring it out. Welcome back. And here the move is surprisingly not queen takes c5, which wouldn't be as accurate, but it is knight h6 check. King h8, of course, is not possible due to knight f7, and then you lose the queen. Therefore, black has to take here. 
Bishop takes f6. And the biggest problem for black in this case is that not only you have a problem with queen on d8, but if it moves, you are going to face eventually mating threats with the bishop and queen combo. So black decides to take, and it's actually the beginning of the end. Takes rook e8, f4, is chasing the rook away, queen f5, rook d6. Now, achieving a winning position is not as hard as it seems, but actually winning them is the magical part of chess. So Machulski plays rook d1, seemingly losing another piece. However, that wouldn't work due to this very nice little check and idea, and then the rook would fall. Bishop g7, and queen takes d1, wins the rook. Bishop e4, knight takes c4, king f2, not really worried again, because if you stop this idea of knight f6 check, then there is queen g4. Otherwise, you are going to face the wrath of this knight f6 check again. So rook takes e4, was played out of desperation, queen takes e4, a3 takes. Not actually giving any counter chances for Geller. d5, queen e2, g3, over defending all those pawns. c4, check, check, king f3. Putting the king on the wide squares where this bishop cannot ever reach. And in that case, that king is going to be quite safe. Rook d2, queen f5, check, check, takes on a6. Now the a pawn becomes menacing. Queen b7, f5, combining it with some threats on the king side. Check, can capture due to queen c5 and losing the bishop. g4, a4, takes a5, the pawn is now running down. Queen takes, queen e6, queen takes, check, check, king d3. And without waiting for white's move, black resigned. So I really hope you enjoyed this little lesson on a Rui Lopez Gambit, sacrificing the D-pawn and then going in with Rook E1 and E5, gaining space for the sacrifice material. If you have any questions, do post that below in the comment section. And otherwise, hope you had a good watch and see you next time.